Elm Logistics. For all your logistic needs, call 631-299-3595. That's 631-299-3595. Elm Global Logistics. Pride, performance, and partnerships. So everybody understands, uh, many people think that Paul and Mike were brothers. They were not. Right. They were very close. They may as well have been. Yeah, but but, you know, but yes. there's the, the thing in the, is yes. like that was his brother, and then sure. he brought him into business. Sure, you know, gotcha. Uh, unless they were lying to me or working me the whole time, <laughs> which could be. This is wrestling, after and all. I know. But they they weren't uh, brothers, but they were very, very, oh yeah, very close. Bacon and eggs, right? So after PN News, then we're going to bring on our guest, and uh, I'm going to let them share their thoughts. Hello, PN News here. I'm still kind of in shock about what's going on in the last couple of days. And um, I really don't feel fit to talk about the guy. And I kind of want the family to get through this. But I just want to give a real tribute out to my best friend um, who I have in this business. And um I know he's in a better place now, and when the time's come and, and when the time's right, um, with the family's uh, approval, you know, I'll I'll leave out a little bit more information. But right now, I just want to say uh, rest in peace to my best buddy, and uh, um, yeah, I uh, I know that he's in a better place, and I think that. Uh, I think when it's all said and done, and uh, I'll meet him again one day. So whether it's in hell or high water, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, we'll both be there for each other. So uh, God bless you, Mike Halleck, and yeah, God rest your soul, brother. Um, I'll be talking about you soon, and you'll be always in my thoughts. All right, welcome back. Um... We've got guests and friends and co-workers of Mike. Guys, can you introduce yourself to the family here? Guys? Hi, I'm, I'm Faustus McGreaves. Um, I've been uh, really close friends with Mike for the last decade. Um, and actually, I just finished uh, making a documentary about him called The Mighty Mantar. Which, um, we were actually going to be out in L.A. in a few weeks from now uh, at some premiere screening it. Can um, you tell us? Can you tell us about this documentary, if you don't mind? Yeah. Uh, well, okay. So I'm a filmmaker. I don't usually make documentaries, but uh, I, you know, I became friends with Mike, and I, I'll be to be honest. You know, I I knew wrestling from the '80s. I was in my teen years in the in the '90s, and I I didn't follow it as much. Um, so I actually didn't know who Mantar was. And uh, we were both acting on a film, and uh, he was just as you already were talking about, just this massive guy. And I remember we were doing a film that actually was about wrestling. And I walked in, and and uh, we had a scene together uh, where he had a I was fighting the heel, and he had to separate us, and. At the time, I was about 275, and he pushes me to separate me, and I flew across that locker room, and I thought my collarbone was broken. And I was like, oh, man, you've got to go lighter. And he, he, he wasn't even trying. He wasn't trying to hurt me. Wow. He, such a strong guy. Uh, after we were done filming that, I figured out one way or the other, I figured out who he, who he was. Um, and uh, I think because I wasn't uh, a fanboy or anything, um, and he respected, he want, you know, he was just getting into films, so he respected my craft, and uh, we could just talk on the level, and we just became great friends. And I remember thinking, here, here I am, not caring about wrestling, um, listening to his stories, and just being so fascinated by them. And I thought to myself, well, if a non-wrestling fan can sit here and listen to him for hours and be interested, then I think that's a good subject. I personally So I talked to Mike, bought him a steak dinner, and I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I said I personally know how excited he was about this documentary. Um, he said it took almost five years to make, right? 
Yeah, well, we filmed it in 2019, and then COVID hit. Um, and so we had to pause everything. And then uh, really, you know, I started putting some of it together, um, but there was a big pause. And he called me up and he said, you know, listen, you MF, um, <laughs> you know, you got to finish this documentary. Um, and literally that was in April. And so I dedicated the next month uh, to just purely working on the documentary and finished it at the end of May. Did Mike get to see um, the finished uh, product? He did. He did. He did, and he loved it. He did. Yeah, well, the documentary, uh, and, you know, the tagline is, this is not a story about wrestling. It's a story about a man who wrestles. Um, and, yes, you got background on Mike and, and his time in the WWF, um, as it was called in the 90s. Um then you get stories from when he was over in Europe. But it's really about uh, the title is the Mighty Mantar, and it's ironic because it's also about how his body was so broken, hmm. um, and the toll that it took on him and his family. Um, and also, it deals with CTE. And I'll tell you this, and it, it goes into that in the documentary. We list all the symptoms of CTE. And you can't diagnose it until after you've passed, which he now has. And I know he's getting an autopsy, so we'll see. But he had every single symptom of CTE. Um, so I, I guarantee this, even, even if he hadn't passed, that by the end of that film, there wouldn't be a dry eye in the theater. Because he opens up and he puts away his bravado and you really see his pain, his hurt, his fears. And Mike was adopted and you kind of touched on this a little bit uh, earlier about his you, wanting to, he want, wanting people to think that he did everything he could and that he was worth people's time. And he said that he wanted, the biggest thing he wanted to do was to prove to his adopted parents that they made a good choice in adopting him. Um, I, I, I still can't even believe this. Uh, you said that you got to know him in the last a year or so and, and how you know felt really close to him. And I got to know him in the last 10 years. And I did say, I'm glad I got to know you now instead of when you were younger, because he was a jerk. <laughs> I mean, he admitted it. <laughs> you know, and uh, he was mean to everyone. And, he, you know, he, he was the toughest kid. In the, he thought, you know, he was the toughest guy in Omaha where he lived. Um, and, you know, he had a lot of ego and all that. But he was a changed man. And I got to know him. Well, although he was broken physically, I got to know him where I think spiritually personally he was at his best mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. could I could I ask you this um, say you knew Mike was going to pass what would you say to him I'll tell you this he talks about it in the documentary too but he doesn't have regrets I mean, it's interesting. It's not ironic because he says he doesn't have regrets, but he said there are a couple of things you know that I changed, brother. But I, I, you know, he really lived his life, and his new motto of you know you die once, but you know you live every day, and that was Mike. I mean, he was gregarious, he was funny, he was strong, he was scary, he was a loving father. Um. He was a great friend, and uh, he's, I'm going to miss him. It's hard to talk about it. Understood. Uh, Understood. If, I can, if I can lighten it a little bit, you said you took him to a steak dinner 